Hello YouTube, I'll continue my reading on the book uh, The Battle of Adwa, African Victory in the Age of Empire by Raymond Jonas. Chapter 6 Africa and Italy what Manga Shah lacked in intellect, he made up for in looks. He was tall, with fine skin and delicate features. His wide-set doe eyes had a seductive quality. A trim mustache, a sole patch, and a short beard added a dash of style and gravitas. His hair, often braided, alluded to his sol soldierly qualities. Mangasha was a dandy and, like all dandies, was blessed with a knack for self-presentation. A photo portrait shows him in the classic aristocratic cape of black silk, which contrasted with the fine white fabric rolled loosely about the neck. Although pictures capture his penchant for jewelry, he wore small looped earrings, they don't capture the aroma. Mangasha loved perfume, a rare affectation in Ethiopia. Perfume was brought from the coast by Muslim merchants and so had infidel associations, especially among Christians of an older generation. Perfumed vain effeminate, Mangasha could brush off such criticism. What gnawed at him was his thawed ambition, thwarted ambition. His claim on the imperial throne. Mangasha was the illegitimate son of Emperor Johannes, the product of a casual liaison between the emperor and a lover whose name is lost to history. Mangasha claimed that Johannes, mortally wounded in battle with the Mahdi in 1889, had recognized Mangasha as his son and successor on his deathbed. In the succession struggle that ensued, however, Mangasha was outclassed. If Mangasha was to challenge Minilik and succeed Johannes as emperor, he would have to earn it. His greatest asset was Alula, a man who had, who had served Johannes faithfully and who, upon the emperor's death, shifted those loyalties to the sun without hesitation. Alula was a legendary fighter. In the 1870s, he had defended the Ethiopian highlands against the incursions of the Egyptians, defeating them at Gura and Sahati. He did no less to the Italians in the 1880s, perpetrating the massacre at Dogali and earning Italy's grudging respect. Alula to the Italians with the Ethiopian Garibaldi. It's hard to imagine a higher compliment than to compare the fierce falcon-nosed Alula to Giuseppe Garibaldi, the father of modern Italy. But even with such talent at his side, Mangasha could never quite carry the role of pretender. In fact, beside Alula, Mangasha faded. It was a classic triumph of talent over lineage. While Mangasha's claim to power rested on his lofty birth, Alula was an upstart, a man who owed his American-style ascent from obscure but no doubt hard-scrabble origins to his fighting skills and political realism. Alula would be known to history as the best native general and strate strategist that Africa had perhaps produced in modern times. Mangasha was propped up by Alula's skill and dodged dogged loyalty. It was a compliment to Alula, but a cruel slam at Mangasha that Alula was known to be both mind and arm, the intellect and the might of the dim and vain would-be emperor. No one was better prepared to exploit the death of Johannes than Minilik. The king of Shoa had been plotting against Johannes for years, building up his army and conspiring with Italy against him. The Italian emissary Pietro Antonelli 
first visited Ethiopia in 1879 at the tender age of 20, and he had been cultivating ties to court ever since. In 1885, the Italian occupation of Masawa, Matsawa gave Menelik and Italy a common enemy in Johannes, and the bond deepened, just as the British had used Johannes against Tedros, Antonelli knew that building up Menelik would distract and weaken Johannes. For his part, Menelik was more than willing to be used, just as he had he made use of the Italians. Italy made a major source of firearms with which Menelik would both challenge Johannes and expand his domain. In a transaction that captured the essence of their relationship, in the aftermath of Dogali, Menelik promised Italy revenge against Alula and Johannes in exchange for 10,000 Remington rifles and 400,000 cartridges. cartridges. All the while, Menelik fed Antonelli's image of Ethiopia as riven by factions. Not only Menelik himself, but also Tekle Haimanot of Kodjam and Ras Mikael of the Wallo Oromo were depicted as restive and ready to break with Johannes. It was not a picture wholly discordant with reality or with history. Traditions of banditry and the habitual joking, jockeying of regional chiefs easily sustained the illusion that Johannes was the sole stabilizing force in an Ethiopia seething with discontent. Antonelli imagined that sponsoring Menelik while occupying the Red Sea ports of Masawa, Masawa and Zaila, thus limiting Menelik's access to the sea, prepared the way for Italian dominance in Ethiopia. Antonelli deeply admired Johannes for having forged an Ethiopian empire, but he foresaw that the death of the emperor would unleash hell, a civil war where, quote, a thousand pretenders would fight over an empire that no longer is, unquote. Italy, having backed Menelik, would be in a position to exploit and dominate a divided Ethiopia. By the late 1880s, Antonelli was sh shuttling between Rome and Addis, working out the details of a pact with Menelik. Italy was ready to enter a military alliance with Menelik, in which Italy would support Menelik against Johannes. If Johannes attacked Menelik, Italy agreed to respond immediately by pushing up from the coast to the highlands, occupying Asmera. Such a move would threaten Johannes from the north at the same time that it secured land for Italy. In effect, Menelik was buying allies with land, condoning Italian, Italian encroachment on territory Johannes claimed for Ethiopia. When Johannes had learned about the plotting of Menelik and the Italians, he sought to rally Menelik to his side under the banner of Ethiopia. Quote, if the two of us remain united, unquote, he wrote to Menelik, quote, with the help of God, we will win, unquote. Menelik was playing a high-risk game, and he was not without his critics, some of them powerful. If Menelik could see how Antonelli and Italians were useful, Thai too could barely restrain her content. As a northerner, she headed the Tigrayan contingent at Menelik's court, greeting Antonelli with a mix of ill humor and sarcasm. But Menelik would not break with Antonelli and Italy as long as Johannes was alive. And he was taking no chances. At the same time that he cultivated his relationship with Italy, he was courting France at the very highest levels. Encouraged by Ilg, he wrote to Jules Gravy, president of the French Republic, presenting himself as an honest broker, the benevolent peacemaker in a dispute be between Johannes and Italy. Somehow the part of Menelik that conspired against Johannes could get along with the part that was an Ethiopian patriot. Just as Menelik could take money and weapons from Italy without being brought, he felt he could undermine Johannes without undermining Ethiopia. Johannes has good intelligence about Menelik's dealings, and he was unafraid to act against those who were insubordinate. He had punished Takla Haimanot for such scheming, sending Ras Alula as his avenging angel. 
Alula humi humiliated Takla Haimanot, forcing him to seek refuge in a mountain hideaway. One thing saved Melnilek from a similar confrontation with Johannes in the fall of 1888, the remoteness of Shoah relative to the nearer threat of Mahdi invasion. While Johannes prepared for war against the Mahdi, the Kazi crusade that would end with his death, Pietro Antonelli was arriving in Addis Ababa with letters, gifts, 4,700 Remington rifles, and 220,000 cartridges. By then, Menelik had already campaigned with an army of more than 100,000 soldiers, demonstrating a might rivaling that of the emperor. Italy had helped to build Menelik, its client, into a major regional player. In March 1889, Menelik and Taitu were in the town of Ujale, with visiting one of Taitu's pro properties. When news of the deaths of Johannes reached them, it was the moment Minilik had been waiting for. He immediately claimed for himself the imperial title of Nugusa Nugust, King of Kings. It was a title Mangasha regarded as rightfully his, as the son of Johannes. Not only did Mangasha have lineage in his favor, he had precedent as well. Historically, Ethiopia had been ruled from the north, from Trigrai. Bolstering that precedent was a strong antipathy among northerners against the south and Shoa. It hardly mattered. Now with Minilik claiming the throne, power shifted abruptly to the south. Addis Ababa, which had barely existed a decade earlier, became the new capital of Ethiopia. More to the point, when Johannes died, the army Minilik had created to challenge him was ready to intimidate even the stubbornest of rivals. Pietro Antonelli, who had assumed responsibility for courting Minilik, building him up and cultivating him as a client for the day the throne was vacant, couldn't believe his good fortune. This turn of events made him look brilliant. He was the mastermind behind the dogged, long-term strategy that was finally paying off. He had backed a winner. He immediately set about formalizing the relationship. The result was a 3D... 3D signed in Wujale, in Italian Udiali, on 2nd of May 1889. The treaty reaffirmed the abol abolition of the slave trade in Ethiopia, Article 14, and gave preference to Italians in trade and commerce with Ethiopia, Article 18. However, the most important piece was Article 17. According to Italy, this article obliged Ethiopia to accept Italian representation of its interest abroad, tantamount to Ital Italian protectorate over Ethiopia. Even though a separate article, Article 19, proclaimed the Italian and Amharic versions of the treaty to be, quote, in perfect concordance with each other, unquote. Disagreement over the Amharic version of Article 17 would become the cause or at least the pretext for the war that would culminate in the Battle of Adwa. Antonelli signed on behalf of King Umberto of Italy, Minilik signed for himself. It was a measure of the respect Ethiopia had garnered in Europe that the Treaty of Wujale existed at all, a state-to-state -state treaty negotiated between sovereign European and African states with a rare thing in the 19th century. The treaty's consequences were many. For Minilik, the agreement was insurance for his throne. He was making good on his promise to swap land for power. Mere months after the signing, in August 1889, the Italians moved up from Masawa into the Kul Highlands and occupied Asmara, where their presence would distract Mangasha and vex Alula. Just as it, Italy had preoccupied Johannes, so it would preoccupy Mangesha, keeping him pinned in the north where he could do little mischief. Menelik set about consolidating his authority in other ways. Like Napoleon, he used family members as trusted local rulers, holding them personally accountable. Daitu's brother, Wele, immediately received the title of Ras and sovereignty over additional territories worthy of his new title. Makonnen, 
Menelik's cousin, remained governor of Hara, east of Addis Ababa. Menelik demanded and received gestures of royalty from other local rulers throughout Ethiopia, with the predictable exceptions of Mangesha and Alula. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian delegation was to visit Italy, Italy later that year with the aim of ratifying in solemn ceremony in Rome the agreement concluded in Wijale. It was a plum assignment, but also one bearing great risk. Someone would have to assume leadership of Ethiopia's first overseas diplomatic mission of modern times. Menelik chose his cousin, Mekonnen. Mekonnen, governor of Harar. Menelik, who was 45 when he claimed the title of emperor, had come to rely heavily on his young cousin. In 1887, as Egyptian power waned and while Johannes and the Europeans were distracted by Dogali, Menelik seized Harar, 200 miles east of Addis. It was a move of great strategic importance. Sir Richard Burton, who is thought to be the first European to have entered the city, repeated a Harari saying he heard in 1854, he who commands at the coastal town of Berbera holds the beard of Harar in his hand. Not only was Harar a major market town, it was Minilik's getaway to the sea. Minilik knew that his independence depended on it. As soon as his soldiers had secured the place, Minilik installed Mekonnen, then a mere 35 years old, as governor. The walls of Harar, made of stone bound by ochreous clay, vary from 5 to 15 feet in height. Five heavy gates and 15 towers create an impression of security that soothed harried travelers arriving from Somali coast by way of the Afar desert. One relieved visitor exclaimed that Harar seemed built of chocolate. Inside the walls, Harar teemed with life. The residents of Harar itself, Burton claimed, made up a distinct race. The steady arrival and departure of caravans kept things lively as did the diverse population that lived there or arrived on market days. The rural population of the Hara region is largely Oromo, and in addition to that language and Adari, which was the language of Hara itself, one could regularly hear spoken Amharic, Arabic, Greek, Hindi, Italian, French, English, Turkish, Armenian, and from time to time, German. The population of Harar numbered in the tens of thousands, its narrow, rain-rutted rain earthen streets funneled the population towards its public squares, giving the town an intensely urban feel. In market squares and on adjacent streets, everything was for sale. Millet, lentils, and barley were displayed on mounds, jujuba, bananas, and citron. Citrons were stacked on tables alongside fine locally handwoven cloth. Porters shouldered heavy loads of coffee on goatskins. Vendors touted honey, butter, and the stimulant chat. In the dry season, dust swirled in the sun's glare, mixing with the smells of coffee, rotten fruit, and dung. Stray ostriches started, startled and buck bucked. Goats and cattle were sold and butchered in the open squares, their gaping necks adding odor and color to the trade. The spectacle of crowds shuffling over blood-washed earth, speaking in tongues, gave Harar an apocalyptic quality. The hierarchy of trade descended from ground floor shops, followed by wood-framed merchant stalls, butted up against walls and shaded by makeshift awnings. In the squares or shops where no more than wares spread over blankets nearby, peddlers worked the crowds and neighborhoods on foot. Most vendors disappeared at dusk, which arrives promptly at 6.30 thanks to the equatorial latitude. That was when the hyenas moved in via gaps in the walls. Harar had no formal waste removal other than nature itself. 
By night, the hyenas entered scavengers taking what suited their appetite, leaving the remainder to be washed by seasonal rains. Today, Harar has much of the look and feel of a North African town, though a bit worse for wear. In the 19th century, it was a little different. European visitors noted the resemblance, finding the town both picturesque and a little barbaric by North African star- standards. The fact that Harar had been fought over by Egyptians and Shoans surely had something to do with this well-used appearance. The Shoan occupation of Harar was brutal, and Minilik had moved quickly to put a stamp on the town. After the conquest, Minilik announced, quote, This is not a Muslim country. Everyone knows. As everyone knows, unquote. Makonnen had the main mosque torn down, as if to drive the point home. He replaced it with an Ethiopian Orthodox church designed by an Italian architect. Harar was a gem, the terminus for caravans from the coast and the commercial capital of a rich agricultural region, an Eden for some, specializing in coffee. But whether it was Eden or something else, for Burton it was Tuscany, which perhaps amount to the t- same thing. Harar was the jewel in the imperial crown craft created by Minilik's aggressive expansion to the west, south, and east. Like the conquest of the Walaita, the incorporation of Harar could be justified as a strategic necessity, an Ethiopian real politic without which Adwa would have been impossible. Just the same, like the Egyptian expanded, it displaced. Minilik's aggressive annexations bore witness to an indigenous African colonialism. Minilik was determined to extract as much as possible from his conquest. A special tax was imposed. Some members of the European population were forced to provide loans. Minilik got what he wanted, but it took years for the business climate to recover. Incorporating Harar was just the beginning. As governor of Harar, Makonnen operated as Minilik's viceroy. At an elementary level, Makonnen's job was to preserve order and forward tribute extracted from the coffee and coastal trade. In reality, in reality, his work was immensely complex. He had to manage what was easily Ethiopia's most cosmopolitan city. Plus, as the first Ethiopian official most visitors met, he was the face of Minilix Ethiopia for official delegations making their way to the capital. Visitors of state were greeted on the approach to Harar as much as a day's journey out. Mounted troops on parade dress formed the escort their horses trimmed with silver tack. The riders themselves wore capes of purple velvet or embroidered silk and carried animal skin shields. Music, horns, and flutes added to the pageantry. The transition in vegetation from the Afar desert is so abrupt that the impression is all the more intense. Grassy pasture and a meadowland comes into view and soon steep hillsides turn abruptly to gorges where fig trees thrive. The terrain stabilizes in natural hedges of rosebush and euphorbia frame patches of land devoted to coffee cultivation. Hatter itself sits in a basin as caravans cleared the path a mile away. Its minarets, its wall, and its flat-roofed buildings come into view. As the only story... As the only two-story structure in town, Makonnen's governor palace stood apart. Its gleaming white walls and tall windows with Roman arches presented an unmistakable profile to visitors as they approached the town. Awnings on the windows and a scalloped finish running along the top of the foot-thick walls softened on an otherwise fortress-like facade. facade. Banners fluttered from its gate-like entrance. On balance, the imposing structure served to accentuate the gracious reception of the host. Despite his reserve, Makonnen managed to communicate warmth. 
he unfailingly received emissaries and merchants with style and tact. On official occasions, he received guests cordially, though formally in a black silk skirt, shirt with colored piping, usually with a matching black silk cloak fastened with a gold clasp at the neck. McConan had a long, thin face, a full mustache, and a goatee described as, quote, too long for a man of the African race, unquote. Many visitors noted his dark, lively, somewhat mournful eyes. McConan had lost his Oromo wife at a young age. He never remarried. While piety was not unusual among his contemporaries, fidelity was. It was said that his fidelity to his Oromo wife mirrored his fidelity to Harar and endeared him to the people of the region. McConan was not above making informal appearances in public, and he ventured outside the governor's palace often, unlike Menelik or Daitu, who rarely were seen without a full retinue, McConan frequently went out in the company of a single advisor, a gesture of trust on his part, and a measure of his popularity and esteem. By all accounts, McConan was an extraordinary intellect. Even his enemies credit him with intelligence, tact, and discernment, he left a vivid impression on everyone he met. A perfect gentleman, Sir James Ronald Rod recalled. Others recalled him as subtle, cultivated, enlightened, courteous, polished. A man who wielded power in a quiet way. Behind the polish, some discerned a personality at once smart, hypocritical, and wily. But no one doubted that he was a formidable figure. He was voted by a Acclamation, the most intelligent man in Ethiopia, alert and intelligent, a quick intelligence, there is no shortage of higher regard. This delicately attractive man possessed a musical voice and cordial, dignified manners. Until his death in 1906, McConan was widely seen as Minilik's successor. He passed on many of his features to his son, Tafari McConan, who Asras Tafari would assume a legendary and lofty status as the focus of the Rastafarian cult in the African diaspora. Though McConan would never rule, his son would succeed Menelik in the fullness of time, ascending the throne as Haile Selassie in 1930. McConan's Harar was more than a diplomatic getaway. gateway. Harar was a cultural hub, a hinge between the coastal towns of the Red Sea which had been steeped in the culture of Islam for generations, and the Ethiopian highlands, where Christianity tended to dominate. Both in architecture and in dress, the city seemed to belong more to the Middle East than to Sub-Saharan Africa. Chalk white stone mortar, mortar dwellings took the place of branch and straw tukul. In the 1880s were an era of commercial pioneers, French Italians, Indian, Indians, Armenians, and above all Greeks sought, if not a killing, at least a living. For many, the be basic idea was to buy something for which a European market no longer existed. Fabrics with patterns or colors deemed de mode, firearms a war or two out of date, and sell them to African buyers. A few, such as the French poet Arthur Rimbaud, represented European firms with offices in Aden or elsewhere, but many operated in their own account, trying to make a living in the import-export trade. Many, including Rimbaud, did both. Rimbaud had arrived in Harar in 1880, where he represented the Bardi firm of Aden, but by 1885 he was also acting as his own agent. He was convinced that he would make as much as 30,000 francs selling a shipment of armaments to Minilik. Rambaud soon discovered that he had no pricing power in a country where there was only one legal buyer of firearms, namely Minilik. After losing months trying to organize a caravan up from the Somali coast, Rimbaud hauled his shipment of slightly out-of-date rifles to Minilik's court. 
There, Rimbaud watched while the emperor took them percent off the top as a customs duty, then dictated the price for the remainder. He even had to accept Minilik's terms. He left his shipment in Minilik's capital in exchange for an IOU and would be paid by Mekonnen upon his return to Hadar. In the end, Rimbaud felt lucky to have recovered his costs. Suitably fleeced, Rimbaud learned the hard way that many other merchants already knew. The better trade was not in direct sales to African heads of state, but in real, in retail sales on local markets. This was where Greeks dominated. As in the California gold rush, much of the real money was not in gold, but in dry goods and liquor. Another lucrative trade was in slaves. As Hadar was the terminus for all trade between Shoah and the coast, it was inevitably a hub of the regional slave trade. There were five jumping off points for caravans to Harar from the coast, but only three were heavily trafficked. Zayla, where the British vigilantly suppressed the slave trade, and Obok and Tadjura, both occupied by the French and both on the Gulf of Tadjura. Ibrahim Abu Bakr and his 12 sons controlled the pre preferred coastal markets in the Gulf of Tadjura and much of the 182-mile caravan route to Harar. Thin and medium height, with a high forehead and darting eyes, Abu Bakr received guests seated on an angarab, draped in animal skins. His everyday dress included a bright tunic and a turban of white muslin. He, res he served coffee to his guests as a gesture of respect, but also some wryly noted as a display of largesse. Abu Bakr drove a hard bargain. He had few friends among those who had no choice but to do business with him. Eyewitnesses, all of them European, it must be said, mentioned no endearing qualities. One bitter acquaintance called him a registered thief. It is difficult to distang disentangle the generally negative accounts of his personality from high-minded disdain for his role in the slave trade and widespread resentment for his strong hold on caravan routes from the coast. His European guests more readily remembered two things about Abu Bakr, that he const constantly work worked prayer beads in his left hand and that he had nasty habit of spitting from a gap between his teeth, heedless of where his spittle landed. One gets the impression that conversations with Abu Bakr tended to be brief. Negotiations, on the other hand, could drag on. A camel could carry up to 300 pounds of goods. A large inventory of, say, rifles might require a hundred camels. It could take a while to round them up as Europeans wilted in the intense heat of the Somali coast. A French caravan was stalled from May until October while sufficient camels were found. Arthur Rimbaud, eager to sell his load to rif of rifles to Minilik, cooled his heels at Tadjura for a year. Such delays were simply another form of negotiation, as additional camels could always be found at a price. Since members of the Abu Bakr clan rarely left the coast, Makonnen had no direct dealings with them. Conversations went through third parties, including the caravans of Harar and Bak. Both parties had strong incentives to keep the caravans moving without incident. Abu Bakr, whose most lucrative business was in enslaved people intended for markets across the Red Sea, depended on a steady supply of captives from the highlands. Minilik not only required an outlet for goods of all kinds, but also needed to import firearms. Even with the best of intentions regarding the slave trade, and the record is mixed, Minilik had little choice but to do business with Abu Bakr.
With the British shutting down both the arms trade and the slave trade via Zayla and other Red Sea ports, Abu Bakr and Menelik needed each other to survive. So strong with the presumption that both parties needed a smoothly operating caravan trade that when anything untoward occurred, a massacre, a robbery, there was the strong presumption of complicity. The massacre of the Baral Sure caravan in 1886, for example, might or might not have been payback for a French naval commander's criticism of Abu Bakr's involvement in the slave trade. It might simply have been a way to hike up caravan rates by underlining the risks. Either way, no one presumed Abu Bakr innocent. Abu Bakr was a cultural broker as much as a merchant. On the coast, he lived among ethnic Somalis, but his Afar descent gave him an entry among the Afar people who controlled the routes the caravans took from the moment they left the Gulf of Tajura until they arrived in Harar. Following Abu Bakr's death in 1885, his sons carried on a thriving trade, bringing goods to Shoa and returning with caravans, frequently of enslaved boys and girls bound for the Arabian Peninsula and beyond. For Makonnen, dealing with the slave trade was one of his precarious tasks as governor of Harar. With Menelik's complete confidence, he controlled who and what entered Menelik's kingdom. Coffee, firearms, ivory, slaves. Nothing moved without his tacit approval. Both Makonnen and Menelik were aware of the disfavor in which the slave trade was held. Menelik had disavowed the trade and had Tedros before him. But the simple fact remained that enslaved people were a key export commodity. As caravans were literally homogenous, most featured disparate commodities shipped together for security, and direct complicity in the trade was nearly unavoidable. And Menelik could ill afford to antagonize those who operated his trade link to the outside world. Moreover, as long as Menelik's soldiers remained largely unpaid, booty, including property, livestock, and slaves taken from among the defeated, could remain part of the soldier's life. Richard Pankhurst, Pankhurst in his Mag Magisterial Economic History of Ethiopia, cites a source to the effect that a slave caravan left Shawa every three months in the 1880s. By the mid-1890s, Menelik was actively suppressing the trade destroying notorious slave market towns, and punishing slavers with amputation. Even then, slavery persisted as a feature of the gift economy. Enslaved people remained a staple of imperial largesse under Minilik, as wedding gifts to friends of the court, for example, as late as 1903. Managing commercial and moral transactions tactfully as part of Mekonnen's charge at Harar, as merchants jockeyed for access and advantage, missionaries elbowed into. Father Louis Turin Kahagne, a Capuchin friar, arrived in 1881 to develop the Roman Catholic missionary pre presence in the region. For a time, he combated the slave trade by buying slaves to save them not only from human bondage, but also from eternal damnation. Turin bought enslaved boys, mostly in their teens, for as many as 50 thalers and as few as 30, took them on as his wards, and prepared them for conversion to the Catholic faith. Some of them enjoyed successful careers thanks to language training in mission schools. In exceptional cases, such boys might themselves become missionaries, carrying on apostolic work among their own people. Turin was assisted and eventually succeeded as bishop by Andre Jarosio, who arrived in 1884. Fifty years later, in the 1930s, Jarosio was still there. As for Mukonnen himself, his work in Harar amounted to a kind of diplomacy school, an internship in dealing with Europeans. 
Long before his departure for Italy, Makonnen had acquired a cosmopolitan polish that would qualify him as Ethiopia's premier statesman. Anyone who could preside over the complicated affairs of Harar, not to mention the Europeans, Afar, Arabs, merchants, missionaries, slavers, and weapons merchants, who made up as many constituencies, was an asset indeed. Later, Menelik would tap him to serve as his representatives on missions to Rome, St. Petersburg, Paris, and London. When the French newspaper Le Tom referred to Maconnen as the second personage in the empire, that is, second only to Menelik, there was surely grumbling in Addis and elsewhere. Anyone as smooth and talented as Maconnen was bound to have jealous detractors. But for Menelik himself, there was really no doubt. When it came time to send an emissary to Rome to finalize the relationship embodied in the Treaty of Ujale, there was no hesitation. He sent Maconnen, the grandeur of Italy. When Maconnen and the rest of the Ethiopian delegation stepped off the train in Rome on August 27th, 1889, it was already a victory for Africa. It marked the beginning of the first high-level diplomatic encounter between Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe of modern times. Five years earlier, Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of Imperial Germany, had convened an international conference on Africa at Berlin. At the Berlin Conference of 1884, the future of Africa lay in the hands of the attending European powers. As the fate of Africa was considered not to be in the hands of Africans, no one had thought to invite any. In its own quiet way, Maconnen's diplomatic mission was a rejoinder to the arrogance of Berlin. A more empathic rejoinder would come in 1896 at Adwa. Maconnen's delegation included translator Joseph Negose, Orthodox priest Waldemekael, the five other high-ranking figures, they were supported by 13 bodyguards and 21 personal servants. Maconnen and his delegation left Harar in July 1889 in the company of Pietro Antonelli and Luigi Capucci. Together, they made their way to the port city of Zela, where they boarded the Com Colombo. The vessel was a fitting namesake for the mission Maconnen had undertaken. His voyage of discovery was leading him to the Old World. Although the Colombo was Italian and therefore flew Italian colors, Maconnen made a quiet independent gesture. From the foresail mast, a flag of horizontal green, yellow, and red bands fluttered in the wind. On the flag's middle band, a proud lion of Judah strutted, holding a cross in his forepaw. It was the first recorded use of this immortal symbol of Ethiopian sovereignty. Much was at stake for the Italians, as they understood it. The Treaty of Ujale linked Italy and Ethiopia in a protectorate relationship. It was incumbent upon them to show their capacity to shelter and protect. The voyage offered plenty of symbols of menace. After the Colombo had passed from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean by way of the Suez Canal, it headed for the Strait of Messina, legendary home of the monsters Sil Scyla and Chirbdis. As the vessels themed among the Aeolian islands, Stromboldi obligingly spewed smoke and stray bits of lava, a convenient metaphor of, for danger at which point an Italian naval squadron arrived as escort. From Stromboli to Naples, the squadron nestled the Colombo and its passengers in its protective embrace. After landfall on August 21st, the Italian display continued. Naples was not only Italy's largest city by far, with 500,000 inhabitants, it was half again as large as Milan, but also the home of the Italian Geographical Society, ardent patron and promoter of an Italian colonial vision. The dockside reception was grand, with diplomats, 
a cabinet-level of official and high-ranking uh, officers of the Army and Navy receiving the delegation in the August heat. An infantry detachment fired off a rifle salute. The Ethiopian delegation clambered into carriages that raced up the Via Toledo to the Grand Palace at Capodimonte. Capodimonte was one of the official regi- residences of the Bourbon monarchy that had ruled Naples and Sicily until the arrival of Garibaldi in the 1860s. It was now being put to use to flatter Italy's new African partner. White tents with blue conical tops dotted the lawn, providing the guests with an alternative to lodging in the rooms inside. The strangeness of it all was unsettling to the Ethiopians. Most chose to bed down outdoors, and the entire delegation slept with swords at the ready. After settling in, Makonnen's group was treated to some of the region's best, a night at Teatro San Carlo, the opera house of Naples, for a performance of Il Barbiere di Siviglia, and a trip to Caserta to see yet another palace, the Bourbon's stunning Versailles-inspired country retreat. After a week in Naples and Campania, McConnell's delegation took the train north, arriving in Italy's capital on August 27, 1889. It had already been an eventful summer in Rome. In June, members of the government invited controversy when they attended the solemn inauguration of the Giordano Bruno statue in Campo dei Fiori. It was a deliberate, deliberate snub to the Vatican, whose predecessors had burned Bruno as a heretic in 1800 on the very spot. Back in Africa with, with the Mekonnen mission en route, Italian, Italian troops moved from Masawa, Masawa into the highlands and occupied the town of Asmara on the pretext laid out in a letter to Menelik that Italian soldiers needed to be housed in a place, quote, not so warm as Mazawa, unquote. Such a move could only have been prearranged. It was an act that paralleled the Makonnen mission and, like it, signaled the deepening Italo-Ethiopian collaboration. However, it also ignited a public debate about the government's colonialist enterprise. Aware of the public's doubts about empire, the government had been careful to couch its steps toward expansion in peaceful terms. The occupation of Asmera was only a means to escape from the heat of Mazawa. The press wasn't buying it. The Vatican newspaper noted that what had begun as a purely commercial enterprise aimed at securing a port in the Red Sea, Mazawa and nothing more, now looked like a strategy of conquest. Even the normally pro-government tribuna pronounced itself averse to colonial expansion and pointedly accorded all merit but also all responsibility to those who had engineered Asmara's occupation. By the time the Makonnen delegation stepped down from its rail car, car, rail car in Rome shortly after three in the afternoon, Roman public opinion was primed. While some favored the government's policy, still others remembered and resented the massacre at Dagali. Most vocal of all were the anti-colonialists who used Makonnen's arrival to protest what was called oddly Italy's pro-African policy. Rome tends to empty in the summer, but a small crowd, mostly workers, was on hand when Makonnen saluted the crowd from the platform by touching his hand to his mouth and forehead before extending his hand to the gathered onlookers. He shook hands with General Emilio Palavinci and a government representative. A much larger and more boisterous crowd, their angry shouts and whistles could be heard inside the station, waited outside where a woefully inadequate cordon of carabin Nieri struggled to hold them back. 
the Carabie Carabinieri captain responsible for the fiasco was later given a dressing down. There were more shouts, whistles, and cries of protest before the delegation was rushed into waiting Landau's, where they sat immobile while the crowd surged to block their path. It took a charge by mounted Carabinieri to clear the way. The press called it an uproar and indecorous. The carriages whisked the delegation past the Dogali monument to the Via Venti Settembre, through the Porta Pia and onto the calm, lush grounds of the Villa Mirafiori. At Verdant Mirafiori, every need had been anticipated. Sheep and cattle had been set to pasture on the Miria Mirafiori lawn, ready to be butchered. According to Ethiopian custom, inside the villa, a special low table under two feet high to accommodate Ethiopian dining customs was set out in the dining room. The villa's pantry was well stocked. A curious press reported every activity of the delegation down to the last detail of food and drink. Salad, rice, lobster, and mayonnaise sauce, valer tree wine, cognac, cigars, coffee, benedictine. Sightseeing began the following afternoon. Maconan visited the Pantheon and paid his respects at the tomb of Victor Emmanuel II. Under Agrippa's val vaulted rotunda, Maconan signed the guest book on behalf of Minilik. Security was tight. The scandalous disruptions at the train station would not be repeated. I ask the protection of your majesty. Maconan's real work began on the 29th when he ventured to the Quirinal Palace to meet Umberto, the king of Italy. At the piazza in front of the palace, troops and a military band were ready in full parade, dressed in front of monumental statues, statues of Castor and Pollock. There was a wide security screen, courtesy of the Carabinieri. The Ethiopian delegation was escorted inside the palace and up the grand staircase to the throne room, where not only Prime Minister Francesco Crispi but also all the key ministers, army, navy, state, were present. Beside Umberto's throne were the many individuals who had cultivated the relationship with Minilik over the years, including Pietro Antonelli, Augusto Salimbeni, Cesare Nerazzini, Luigi Capucci, and Leopoldo Traversi. Standing in front of the throne was Umberto himself in military dress. Maconan prostrated himself before Umberto, as required by Ethiopian royal protocol. Once Maconan rose, Umberto politely inquired about Maconan's voyage. The quote of the ceremony came down to mere words, but as the existence of a protectorate would later be disputed, the words matter a great deal. Maconan went first, speaking through his translator, Joseph, Negus Joseph Neguse. Maconan addressed Umberto on behalf of His Majesty the King of Ethiopia and acknowledged a mutual interest in a treaty of friendship and commerce. Maconan again invoked Minilik's name, then uttered on Minilik's behalf the phrase, I ask the protection of your majesty so that peace and tranquility reign in Ethiopia and in the neighboring Italian possessions. Anyone listening would have been forgiven for thinking that Maconan was invoking a protectorate in the name of Minilik. I have heard your words with great satisfaction, Umberto responded. I hereby pledge myself to the treaty drawn up for the common good of the two kingdoms, and to the protection that I and my government grant to your country, with which we sincerely desire peace and prosperity. Italy argued that the Treaty of Ujale, which Mekonnen's presence was to ratify, established an Italian protectorate over Ethiopia. Even though the word protectorate appeared nowhere in the treaty, Mekonnen's invocation of Umberto's protection, followed by Umberto's extension of protection in response, 
seemed to validate the Italian claim. The word itself was splashed on the front page of newspapers reporting the event, coverage that would have been impossible for the Ethiopians to miss. If there had been a misunderstanding, there was ample opportunity for McConnell to clear it up. Was it all part of a ruse? The story was only beginning. After the remarks of McConnell and Umberto, there followed a parade of gifts from Menelik, shields, drums, lances, trimmed in gold and laced with gems, two horns filled with dudge or honey wine, five Oromo saddles, 30 oversized elephant tusks, and one live baby elephant. With the diplomatic and courtly formalities behind him, McConnell embarked upon a tour of Italy. It was a hit parade of Italian cities, Genoa, La Spezia, Pisa, Monza, Turin, Bologna, Milan, Modena, Venice, designed to showcase Italy and justify its status as protector. The Ethiopians were treated to military reviews and cal cavalry maneuvers. They were feted with fireworks and Bengal lights on the canals of Venice. King Umberto and Queen Mar Margarita hosted another royal reception at their grand palace of Monza. Maconan pronounced himself seduced by the charms of Italy. Turin, he explained, was the kingdom of heaven. Was the kingdom of heaven at Lake Como? Quite understandably, McConnell pronounced Italy wicked because, after seeing it, one doesn't ever want to leave. Somehow, McConnell pulled himself away. On the 19th of the September, he and his delegation returned to Rome, where he negotiated an addendum to the Treaty of Ujale, the additional convention, signed at Naples on the 1st of October. For Italy... His addendum recognized de facto Italian authority in lands they occupied according to the principle of uti posseditis, quote, as you possess, unquote. Since Italy had spent the late summer occupying the Ethiopian highlands from Asmera to the Mareb River, this provision recognized a blatant land grab. For Ethiopia, the agreement provided scarce capital in the form of a loan of 4 million lire guaranteed by the it Italian government. Half of the funds were to be made available to Ethiopia immediately, with the remainder to be established as a credit line to be used against purchases made by Ethiopia and Italy. In effect, the line of credit was also a kind of export subsidy for Italian business. As collateral, McConnell put up the customs payments collected at Harar, if Ethiopia defaulted on the loan, Italy was entitled to take over customs operations at Harar until the loan had been made good. Although the additional convention entailed risk, it was a risk both parties were willing to accept. On balance, it was a sweet deal for Italy. For Ethiopia, the stakes were much higher, but the country had little choice. It was struggling to preserve its sovereignty as the European powers circled menacingly. It was starved for resources as agrarian crisis and famine deepened at a moment of supreme peril. In exchange for cash, it offered recognition of what was about to be proclaimed as the Italian colony of Ertera, carved from lands historically claimed by Ethiopia. Although it would later be disputed, Menelik, or at least Makonnen, on his behalf, seemed to be recognizing Italy's annexation not only of Asmera, but also of the regions of Bogos, Hamasen, and Akale Guzai, at least 50 square miles in all. It also received the promise of 2 million lire in sales to Ethiopia via the credit line and the right to occupy Harar should Ethiopia default on the loan. Ethiopia was bedding the bank, trading land for time and money, with Italy ensconced in it. Ertera in the north and Hara trade hawked as collateral in the south, everything was at risk. If Ethiopia lost control of Hara through loan default, it would be utterly at the mercy of Italy. About the time that Makonnen delegation was getting ready to leave, an unusual news story broke. Menelik's gift baby elephant had gone into a rage. 
busted up its stall, and then, with relentless pounding from its trunk, shattered the door and escaped. It took twenty men to corral the animal and return it to its pen. It was a timely reminder that life is full of surprises and that no one can predict, let alone control, the future.